1950, Guatemala had the first communist-dominated government in the Western Hemisphere. By 1954, under the presidency of Colonel Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, Guatemala was well on its way to becoming the first full-fledged member of the communist bloc on this side of the Atlantic. It was then the United States, cooperating with Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas, who was later assassinated, and the current president, Miguel Idigaris Fuentes, provided the moral and material means for the overthrow of Arbenz and the temporary removal of communism from the Western Hemisphere. Our security requires that we control the Caribbean. Guatemala lies almost 900 miles north of the Panama Canal. It is less than 800 miles south of Florida. Cuba, now communist, is less than 700 miles away. Guatemala was the first Latin American country to break relations with Castro. Our Benz is now in Cuba, plotting the return of communism to Guatemala, where the local communists are known to be receiving their support from Castro. Against them stands Edigaris, a man of positive programs and strong arm tactics. The question some reporters raise about Guatemala is whether the tactics promote communism as much as the positive program pushes it back. After a brief period of civilian rule, Guatemala has returned to the pattern of her past military rule, although the strong man, General Edigaris, is the duly elected president. The army is largely made up of illiterate Indians from the interior, who are perfectly willing to use their weapons on people they don't know. Every major building in Guatemala City is guarded. Anyone entering the National Palace is carefully checked by Secret Service men in plain clothes. The armed guards are all over town, and no building is as well guarded as the Casa Crema, the thickly walled home, office, and fortress of President Edigaris. The people, unless prodded, have learned to ignore the army and stay clear of unnecessary trouble. Life expectancy here is 35 years. The Guatemalan worries only about earning enough money, 50 cents to one dollar a day, to feed and clothe his family. The average city dweller, earning 160 to 300 dollars a year, is not the customer for television sets or other appliances imported from the United States. In these stores, the trade comes from the small wealthy class and the rich foreign colony. For them, the best that the United States exports. Before the Spaniards arrived in Guatemala, Central America was the home of the Mayan Indian and his neighbors of other tribes. Today, over 400 years later, there are no more Mayans. The conquistadores killed off their dying culture, but the Indian still remains the dominant race. More than 60% of Guatemala's four million people are Indians. Many of them still wear native dress. Indians who live in or near the cities tend to be street vendors. Some carry their goods many miles and many hours to a stall in a huge enclosed market. Here they sit, wait, bargain and sell at prices below the official government list. The fruits and vegetables are their own and they feel they should get a price they're happy with rather than one the government has established. Most Indian women must set up their baskets on quiet streets where they wait longer and sell less. President Edigaris owes his election in 1958 to the people. His opposition called them the mob. Many of his supporters were the new class of bicycle riders, proud young people, more fleet in their means of transportation, and with every intention of staying one step ahead of their fathers. Edigaris also got some support from the motorcycle riders, but not as much as from those on bicycles. Motorcycles are almost on the same level as automobiles. Many are owned by the rising conservative middle class and by ex-bicycle riders who can afford to pay three years salary for faster, fancier transportation. Very little support came to Edigaris from the small middle class with their carports, television jacks, and $12,500 homes. These civil servants and small shop owners want no change, 
and seek isolation rather than involvement. Not so, however, with the very few rich who control the wealth of Guatemala. They too live isolated lives, but their time is spent in luxurious splendor. There is no personal income tax, and in business they often evade the 48% corporate tax by falsifying their forms. There is no perjury law in Guatemala, and its chance of passage by Congress is slim. In recent years, under the threat of communism, most of their money has been flowing out of the country and into foreign banks, rather than being reinvested in the country. In Guatemala City, as throughout Latin America, communism has made its greatest appeal to the urban slum dweller. To do something for the Indian migrants, who either squatted where they could or paid rents they couldn't afford, Idigris took a plush green valley and turned it over to whomever wanted a home in the city. It soon filled with people. The valley was no longer green, and this slum, La Limonada, was born. Here, over 5,000 people live in squalor, disease, and destitution. Most of the children own no shoes. Although two children in five die before their first birthday, Guatemala has one of the fastest growing populations in Latin America. The Indian comes to the city with hope and no skills. He produces large families and earns 20 or 30 cents a day. A pint of milk costs 12 cents. A pound of black beans, six cents, and a pound of corn, seven cents. For coffee, he drinks ground tortillas burned to charcoal, although Guatemala is the world's seventh largest producer of coffee. The children rarely leave La Limonada to see the big city outside. Seven to nine people live in three rooms without doors. The wooden shacks with their tin roofs are airless, dark, and diseased. They allow no freedom and imbue the family with the one idea of leaving as soon as possible. These children are unusual. Their father is a shoemaker. They will not have ulcers on their feet. In Guatemala City, vultures are the appropriate symbol for the slum. Like Castro's agents on the ground, they are willing to wait. Communists gained a first foothold in Guatemala in 1944 under the administration of Arevalo. By 1950, with the coming to power of Arbenz, they had gained control of labor. By 1951, the entire government was dominated by communists. Men like Che Guevara, unknown then, were running the country for President Arbenz. There was a counter-revolution, an interregnum, then Idigaris took power in 1958. He faced the same problems Arevalo did when he took over from dictator Ubico 14 years before. The communists had solved nothing. Idigaris started a construction boom that has not yet stopped. It has put many of the underemployed to work and has built more houses and office buildings in four years than had been built in the previous 28. Most construction workers earn from 80 cents to $1.25 a day. Some of the more skilled, like bricklayers and plasters, can earn as much as $2 a day. In the first television interview he has ever permitted, President Miguel Idigaris Fuentes discussed what he is doing to combat communism in Guatemala. We can kill the communists with a machine gun. But we can convince the people to come back from the communism to, to our uh, side in anti-communism, giving them all that the communists uh, promised to them. Housing, places where to work, where, places where to be educated, and especially uh, uh, factories. 
We, in, in 1959 to 1961, we have opened more than 200 new factories in the country, and that we call it the, the, our revolution, industrial revolution. But it is very difficult to say, but to put one worker to work is necessary in Guatemala $8,000. In order to open 200, 200 factories necessary to, to, to get money from every place, but they are working now. But now is the market where to, to, where to sell the goods. Guatemala is 4 million inhabitants only. Then I worked very hard and very successful to organize the, <coughs> the common market, the Central American common market and the economical Central American integration. We have now <clears throat> Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua. In some days, Costa Rica will be in. And in some months, Panama will be in. Then, we have where to sell our goods. And where to, bu to, to buy now, of course, another goods for Guatemala. <laughs> Edigaris is always traveling around the country, and his working clothes, when on tour, are his many uniforms. The crowd follows him everywhere, and security is remarkably light. He passes out candy to the children, and women reach out to touch him. He is the caudillo, the supreme leader. On this day, he was touring one of his pet projects, a housing development built with the United States and Guatemalan money. Over 3,000 of these four-room homes have been built under what Edigaris calls a self-help program. Once the funds have been allocated, it's up to the community to supply the land and part of the labor. $14 a month for 20 years, and a man may own a house. Edigar is stopped in a town without new homes or sewage. To maintain his support, he promised he would build them the things they needed. Out of candy, he found a soccer ball, tossed it to the crowd, and returned home. December 1961 saw the end of a mild honeymoon between Edigaris and the people. The students took to the streets to protest the elections in which supporters of Edigaris won most of the seats. Unarmed army officers did their best to break up the marchers. They did not succeed, and things got out of control. Normally quiet, a digorous opposition screamed foul and demanded his resignation. The communists egged on the unstudious, politically-minded students and provided the militant inspiration they needed. Edigaris, having the backing of the army, the national police, and his private force of ununiformed judicial police, sent them out to quell the rioters and restore order. Guns were freely used. Tear gas bombs resulted in chaos. For the first three days, the students were alone in their protest. They fought the police with rocks and the weight of numbers. As the week progressed, adults joined the mob. Business was at a standstill, and a diggerous held firm. Soon, the adults withdrew, licking their wounds, sorry for their feeble protest. They wondered what they would face when it was all over. Peace was not quickly restored. The demonstrations went on for months. The judicial police, in plain clothes, and the national police soon gained the upper hand. Support of the government grew out of fear of reprisal as violence and brutality reached its peak. Guns were put away for primitive weapons. Machetes and clubs were brought out to do their work more quietly, but no less efficiently. At the end of six months of sporadic rioting, more than 20 were dead, hundreds wounded, and Edigaris was still there, still strong, still, in fact, popular. The 
national anthem of Guatemala, sung by many of the same students who rioted and were on strike from school for more than six months. An engineering student told us he has completed three semesters in the last four years. The other five semesters he was organizing a demonstration or out of the country. He is the rule, not the exception. Last May 8th, the 55 student groups voted to return to school. They debated on and passed their Magna Carta for Guatemala. They asked Edigaris to resign unless he rids his government of the monumental graft and corruption, which he says does not exist. They asked him to cut his $17,000 a month salary and to drop his million dollar a year personal security fund. They also asked that the emergency military cabinet be dissolved and replaced with the original civilian one. Edigaris said he would consider their demands, sent no police to the meeting, and for a change there was some peace. But the students ignored Guatemala's basic problem. Three quarters of the people live on the land, and 90% of that land is owned by 6% of the population. The Indians grow one major crop, corn. The communists tried to redistribute the land, diversify crops, and change their way of life, but they failed. Edigaris is not doing much better. The Indians do not have a tradition of peasantry. They fear responsibility, and when farming for themselves, they are easily discouraged. Bananas were once a major crop. Bad weather, disease, and the communists' attempt to distribute the land decimated production. Bananas may soon become a minor crop. There are plans to take up the loss with sugar cane. Cane cutters and loaders work as long as they want and as fast as they want, are paid piecework and average 80 cents a day. The United States has agreed to buy 5,000 tons of sugar a year, paying in part with corn. Cuban exiles are helping to grow the cane and guide its development. Cotton exports have tripled in recent years. With the emergence of the Central American common market, the future of Guatemalan cotton looks good. Mahogany is one of the least developed products in Guatemala. It grows in the northern part of the country where poor roads make shipping almost impossible. Very little of the wood is exported. It is used locally, and most middle-class homes have mahogany doors, paneling, and window sills that cost next to nothing. Guatemala is the world's seventh largest producer of coffee. Over the last five years, world price fluctuations have cost Guatemala an estimated $300 million. In a country dependent on coffee for its foreign trade, this loss has emphasized the need to diversify farming, and there is an overriding need for more education. The best way to, to, to educate, to, to bring up the people is in Guatemala is to induce the people to be in, the, in a democrat, democratic uh, uh, channels. Because in Guatemala we have had dictatorships for one year, two years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty-two years, and one thirty years. And it's very difficult now to change the mind of the people that the father, the grandfather, the great grandfather, the great great grandfather were uh, under the rule of, uh, of a military boot, of a civil boot, but uh, a dictatorship. But in another way, we are building now more schools in, 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 in two years than four presidents uh, uh, behind me. Edigaris spends at least two days of every week touring the interior in his private plane. He makes it his business to attend the opening of every new school. He believes education is the most important part of his program. Since coming to office in 1958, he has built 186 schools and promises to have another 300 completed when his term ends in 1963. 50 to 75 percent of the population cannot read nor write. Many of the more than two million Indians speak no Spanish. Teachers have to be found who speak one of the 12 known dialects, first to teach the Indian to read and write his own language, and then teach him the official and common language of the country. In his school program, supplemented with funds from the United States and the same community effort that builds homes, Edigris has met his greatest opposition. His opponents contend that thirty or forty thousand dollars is too much for a school, and they say his schools are too elaborate. His answer is that nothing is too elaborate when it comes to education. 
We can't kill the communists with machine guns, he says, but we can give the people all the communists promised them, particularly places where to be educated. Edigaris the strong man is a complete politician. He loves crowds, and apparently crowds love him. His bodyguard is always nearby and always nervous as he plunges into a crowd, shakes hands, pats heads, and does everything but kiss babies. He has the politician's essential gift of patience. He sits on the platform, watches the ceremonies, and never looks bored. Edigris cannot constitutionally succeed himself. He can do something that few Guatemalan presidents have ever done, that is, pick a successor to pave the way for his return when his six-year wait is up. This may be why he is always campaigning in the interior. The more sophisticated people in Guatemala City do not support him. They have been too close to material improvement, and they have suffered too much by his periodic brutal suppression. It is to the Indian he comes, gives of his efforts tirelessly, and hopes for blind fidelity in return. After the ceremonies were over and most of the 5,000 faithful had gone home, a digorous and a select group appeared to relax for the first time during the long, hot day. At lunch, the general continued talking, continued working, continued planning. When the day finally ended, some of the crowd had reassembled to see their leader off. Edigaris' aides were somewhat disturbed because he refused to hurry and insisted on shaking as many hands as possible. But the elections of 1963 and 1969 are more important than safety. Guatemala is a classic example of a Latin American characteristic which we understand only vaguely. Namely, that while each of the countries shares general characteristics of underdevelopment, poverty, lack of economic growth, and capital investment, yet each country is unique. Edigris is a duly elected strongman. He employs most of the weapons of the dictator or police state. And yet, he is running and campaigning as energetically as any courthouse politician. He erects no monuments to himself, no squares, streets, or highways bear his name or likeness. So in this respect, Guatemala is a non-classic dictatorship. One Guatemalan student, stammering and gesticulating out of his frustration, finally said to our reporter, there is nothing here to tear down. Guatemala and Edigris also cause us to beware a beautiful but unreliable platitude which used to spring from our naivete. Namely, that the installation of genuine democratic processes would solve most of the problems. It's a lovely thought. Well, next week, a look at Vermont, where the rural voter is king. Chet Huntley reporting. Good night. This is Lorne Green. Inviting you to join Pennell Roberts, Dan Blocker, Michael Landon, and me for Bonanza in color, Sunday night at 9, 8 Central Time, here on NBC. by NBC News, which is solely responsible for its content. Bill Hanrahan speaking.